Okay, now I'm, I'm ready to introduce our speaker for tonight, uh, Dr. Jill Knapp, uh, who practices uh, internal medicine and cardiology at the International Health Institute of Montana here in Missoula. Dr. Knapp is a cardiologist. He's been practicing here in Missoula since 1982. Presently, he's the director of medical research at the International Heart Institute of Montana Foundation. He completed his undergraduate education at Santa Clara University and attended medical school at Georgetown University. Uh, he completed an internal medicine residency and earned a cardiology fellowship at the University of Arizona. His public health education was at the University of Washington. Among his professional interests are advanced cardiac imaging with cardiac ultrasound, in particular three-dimensional real-time imaging. He has a particular passion for practical implementation of best practices in the real world of healthcare delivery and the appropriate use criteria and what it implies for the practice of medicine. Joe is interested in the comparative effectiveness of research and population studies in rural America. And he's gonna be talking tonight about his work in Ethiopia, uh, working on uh, cardiac uh, uh, operations with uh, with children in, in Ethiopia. So let's welcome Joe Kanat for, for the final lecture. In the lecture. Okay. Um, if you can't hear me, say something. Because if I don't know if you don't, if you can't hear me, I want you to chime up. Um, what's been going on back here? This is actually just a panoply of slides of the small hospital that I work in in Addis Ababa, which is the capital of Ethiopia. This is an interesting story, and I think, think it bears some, some dis, just, just discussion about, um, we live in a very tumultuous international environment, but there is an enormous amount of international collaboration that's going on right now by a lot of people uh, to do some really good things in very difficult environments. Um, if um, Ethiopia is a fascinating country. Um, have any of you read Cutting for Stone? A few of you have. Um, if you really want to get a flavor of what modern day Ethiopia is all about, this book is, is a, a marvel. Um, it actually is written by an individual who is Indian by descent. He's a, an internal medicine physician at Stanford. Um, and the reason his perspective is so important is, is that so much of the influence of healthcare in Eastern Africa is actually from the, from the Indian subcontinent. They have an enormous footprint and have had an enormous effect upon healthcare in all of, of, uh, of Eastern Africa, in, in Ethiopia included. And I'm gonna read a couple of paragraphs from this book because I think it gives you a sense or a flavor. Anybody here been in Eastern Africa? Um, give you a flavor of what Eastern Africa is all about in, in modern day Eastern Africa. The plane descended, slipping into and out of the scattered clouds over Addis Ababa. The dense forest of eucalyptus trees at first concealed the city. The Emperor Menelik had imported eucalyptus years before from Madagascar, not for its oil, but as firewood, the lack of which had almost made him abandon his capital city. Eucalyptus had thrived in the Ethiopian soil and it grew rapidly, 12 meters in five years, 20 meters in 12 years. Menelik had planted it by, by the hectare. It was indestructible, always returning in strength wherever it was cut down and proving ideal for the framing of houses. And as you'll see, they actually use it still today in the form of scaffolding for building. And you'll see, actually show you some, some, some of that here in a little bit. The trees, the trees revealed clearing with circular thatched roofs and a thorn enclosure to keep the animals penned in. Then at the edge of the city, she saw corrugated tin-roofed houses, abundant and still close together. A church with a short spire came into view, and then the city proper. The glimpse of the city center, which looked so modern, made her think of Emperor Haile Selassie. He had brought about more change in his reign than the country had undergone in three centuries. Down at street level, his portrait 
would be in every house. Hema's father was, of the, was the emperor's biggest fan because just before World War II, as Mussolini stood steady to invade, Emperor Haile Selassie warned the world of the price of standing by and allowing Italy to invade a sovereign country. God and history will remember your judgment, he said famously before the League of Nations, and they did. Okay. Near the airport, an entire hillside had turned into a flaming orange from the blooming of the mescal flower which told her that the rainy season must, must have ended. Another hillside was covered with lean-tos and shacks of corrugated tin, the colors rust brown or a dark corrosive hue. Each shack shared a wall with its neighbor so that collectively they looked like long, irregular railroad cars that snaked across the hill, sending buds and offshoots in all directions. It just gives you a sense and a flavor of what this country is all about. Ethiopia is the only African country that was never conquered. Um, it was invaded by the, by, the, by the Italians during World War II, but was never a, con was never a conquest. It has been an independent country since its, in since its beginnings many millennia ago. It's also a fascinating country because it is a predominantly Christian country, Coptic Christian dating back to the third century, or actually even earlier than that, uh, and intriguingly has a, has a very large Mus minority Muslim population, somewhere around 20%, along with a very sizable animist and native culture as well. And intriguingly, it is one of the few places on the, on, the, on the globe where the Muslim traditions and the Coptic Christian conditions still live side by side in relative harmony. There is interreligious marriage, there is interreligious inter interactivity on a routine basis. It's a strikingly interesting country from that standpoint alone. There is major strife that's tribal in nature there is minimal strife that is religious in nature. It's really a fascinating place. I got involved here as a result of a, uh, an interaction with a remarkable man um, who was on here, for those of you who first came in, he's a, he's a, uh, a pediatric cardiologist, Ethiopian, who was uh, one of 12 children in his family. His mother and father were high school teachers in northern Ethiopia, really up on the Eritrean border. And, um, they were such ad, uh, adamant believers in education that all 12 of their, all 12 of their, their children have postdoctoral degrees. Uh, remarkable. They live all over the world. Uh, many of them, some of them, three or four of them are in medicine. A couple of them are, are really world-renowned researchers at the National Institutes of Health. This individual uh, whom I have worked with um, uh, basically went to medical school in Ethiopia, um, came to the United States, did his advanced training at NYU uh, in New York City, interestingly, and if, if any of you have read this book, there's a lot about what goes on in this book in New York City, so it's, it's near and dear to him. Um, and then after he finished his training, um, different from, from most of his brothers and sisters, decided to go home, and he went back to Ethiopia. He was the first cardiologist in Eastern Africa, um, and until just a few years ago, was the only pediatric cardiologist in Ethiopia, population 90 million. Um, Ethiopia is an interesting country in that the median age in Ethiopia is 18. 60% um, of the population is under 20. Now you figure that, that means 50 some odd million of the population is under age 20. 1% uh, of the population is over 60, 1%. Think about that re relative to the world that we live in and that I live in, okay. I'm an adult cardiologist, I work mainly with adults, although in my training many years ago, I actually had a pediatric course in my, in my training. So I had experience in dealing with kids, but I never really operated on kids directly. Although, the program here in Missoula, we do a lot of heart valve repair surgery. Um, the topic of this, of this lecture was basically the, uh, the cardiac disease in Ethiopian children, nature and nurture. And the reason that t term came up was that if you look at in, in, in the population of Ethiopia, and this is also true in much of the developing world, they have a very different type of, of exposure, obviously, to disease, illness, et cetera, than we do. And whereas in, in, the world of, of, in the Western world that you and I live in, chronic diseases and self-inflicted diseases, such as cancers, diabetes, obesity, hypertension, high blood pressure, coronary artery disease and strokes are rampant, uh, these conditions are nearly non-existent. In, the, in, in Eastern Africa, as an example, and in much, many parts of the third world. What they struggle with, and particularly if it's, I'll focus upon cardiac conditions in kids, is two things. 
either congenital conditions, things the kids are born with, or infective conditions of the heart, which is extremely unusual in the United States. Up until about 20 years ago, about the only place you would see the rheumatic valvular heart disease that we see in these Ethiopian kids that we operate on, the only, about the only place you would see that was, would be on the Native American reservations in the Southwest. And even that is no longer an issue with the development of reasonable health care uh, for the Native American populations in the, in the Southwest. But in Ethiopia, rheumatic valvular heart disease is still rampant. And these kids live uh, and live very desperate and very short lives as a result of that. Ethiopia is also an interesting climatic uh, condition. I, you know, I knew nothing about, about Ethiopia. My, when I think of Africa, I think of jungle. I think of, of, of vegetative terrain. Well, I'm going to show you something that's an entirely different country. Ethiopia is basically, a, 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 the majority of it is an extremely high plateau, well over 7,000 feet. The capital of Addis Ababa is, is approaching 8,000 feet as far as um, its height. I'm going to change the slideshow and sh just go to a different, to a different one here. This is designed basically. This, this next 15 or 20 minutes will just give you a kind of a brief tour of, of much of, of what Ethiopia is all about. It's a very high plateau. It's about seven, it's almost over 7,000 feet. As a result, three quarters of the of the of the terrain of Ethiopia is is uninhabitable by mosquitoes. Why is that important? One of the biggest killers exactly in, in, in the third world and in Africa in general is malaria. Much of Ethiopia is malaria free. And in fact, Addis Ababa, which is the capital of Ethiopia, is, clear, is truly malaria, malaria free. When you get further west and further south where you drop down off of the high plateau in the Rift Valley, you drop into areas where, 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 um, where um, uh, malaria is again endemic. But in, the, in a huge part of Ethiopia, it really is a very high, almost semi-arid plateau. Um, so that's where these kids live, and that the majority of the folks in Ethiopia still is a fairly, fairly, is a fairly rural community. It's 90 million people, maybe 20%, 25% of them actually live in an urban environment. So these folks live way out in the middle of no place, uh, so many of them. Um, this cardiologist um, whom, um, named Balai Abegaz, who started this whole endeavor, um, Moved, moved back to Ethiopia in the 70s and basically was just inundated with all of these kids with congenital heart problems and with rheumatic valvular heart, heart problems. Well, rheumatic fever, which causes damage to the heart valves, is imminently treatable with penicillin if, 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 because it's a, strep, it's a secondary strep infection. And if, and if, if strep is treated earlier, well, it can basically be eradicated. But getting, getting penicillin into communities of uh, that are very small and disparate was a, quite an, uh, an unwieldy task. And it was a huge public, uh, public health undertaking, which is now, just now, beginning to, to occur in Eastern Africa. At the time he was there back in the 60s and 70s, there was nothing. There, were just not, there was just not the, the public health infrastructure to do anything. And yet he was faced with this dilemma of seeing literally hundreds of kids coming into him with these in, in, incredibly damaged hearts as a result of rheumatic fever. Or, these kids coming in with incredibly um, damaged hearts as a result of congenital heart problems they were born with. And so he began to make contacts literally all over the first world, mainly in Europe, but also in Asia, um, the Indian subcontinent, Japan, and in, the, and in North America, contacting groups to see if, as he identified these kids on one-offs, if he could actually get them sent off to various centers all over the developing world to get things taken care of, get valves, get, get their, either their valves repaired or their congenital lesions reconstructed so that they had the potential for, for survival. One of the big things, Ethiopia, like many um, uh, third world countries, uh, family is what, the world, what it's all about. And the idea of being able to live into your adulthood, which in Ethiopia still is defined as your 20s and 30s, because the majority of people begin, the, 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 the death rates begin to accelerate after about age 40. Um, the hope for most people is to be able to live to actually have progeny, kids, and pass on your heritage. And so that was his entire perspective, is, is that he didn't expect miracles for kids. All he wanted was the opportunity to take a few kids and give them a life expectancy that they otherwise wouldn't have because of either something they were born with or an infectious disease problem they contracted. Um, as a result of, of strep infections that, that were not being treated. And so he made contacts. And over a period of about 20 years, he made enough contacts and got enough funding 
to be able to transport some 250 to 300 kids over a period of 20 years out of Ethiopia to other places to get cared for. Um, and then the light bulb finally went off in his head and he said, well, you know, it's crazy spending all this, these dollars sending these kids off. Why don't we see if we can do something here? And it just so happens that not only were his parents extraordinarily interested in education, but his next, his, truly his best friend from growing up as a kid who lived next door had some parents of a similar ilk. And it just so happens that his, ne his next door neighbor uh, ended up making it, making it very well in the oil industry of Saudi Arabia and in Yemen and actually became, a, is, is indeed a multimillionaire. And with his assistance, was able to build a small children's hospital in Ethiopia where we do our work. And so as a result of a Yemeni sheik of Ethiopian heritage donating money to build this hospital, uh, um, uh, Balai was able to connect with these various disparate groups all over the world, Japan, Madrid, uh, Barcelona, uh, Athens, London, Missoula, Tucson, University of Arizona, Minneapolis, Tokyo, and there are 16 of us, 16 groups all over the world who literally share in supporting the small hospital. And how this all works and the intent of all this, this project which has going, been going on now for about eight years is twofold. Um, we bring our technology um, and our equipment to this hospital, all basically the durable equipment that's needed to help operate on these kids. But what we also bring is our personal expertise and we work side by side with native uh, practitioners, Ethiopian physicians, um, nurses, technicians, side by side um, in basically operating on these kids. Uh, teaching them operative skills, working, working with imaging skills in my particular situation. I have the luxury of working with, with three remarkable Ethiopian physicians, uh, all pediatricians, all trained in Ethiopia. Uh, all of them, uh, at the good graces of this um, benefactor, this, this Yemeni benefactor, uh, also having the opportunity to go elsewhere, some of them to Frankfurt, others to, to other parts of, of um, uh, Europe, to learn additional medical skills. And so what we've been able to do is basically this concept of rather than giving somebody a fish, teaching them how to fish, that's the entire intent. And we're probably a third of the way along. The intent was to have this project done in five years to where we would no longer be necessary and the local physicians would be, and, and practitioners would be able to carry on. But as things go, not only in our world, but in the, in the real world of the third world, things don't ever occur in the ways you want them to. There's all sorts of reasons for that. And so we're well behind the, ball, behind the curve of what was planned, but it's still a work in prog progress. And we are training and working with local physicians in, in Addis Ababa uh, to basically give them the skill sets so that what we do in operating on kids, they can do in our stead. And they actually are working independently to some extent. What I'm showing you here, just, these are just some pictures of Ethiopia and what the countryside actually looks like. As you can see, it's not the typical desert or jungle that you would expect uh, of an African country. It's really a high plains, very much arid. This is actually in northern Ethiopia up in Aksum, which is on the border with um, um, Eritrea and um, uh, one of the ancient capitals of, of Ethiopia right here. Well, just a, a ruined area uh, in that part of the country. Prior to this, you had seen some lakes, which is Lake Tana, which is the headwaters of, of the Nile um, in central Ethiopia, as well as a number of other uh, aspects of Ethiopia. This is the largest hospital in eastern Africa. It's called the Black Lion. It's directly adjacent to the hospital that we work at. Uh, this is how we work. Um, as you can see in the center, uh, that individual who is operating is Dr. Mike Teodori. Uh, Mike is an MIT graduate who did his cardiac training at the University of Pittsburgh and has been, was head of pediatric surgery at Children's Hospital in, Tucson, or in Phoenix, Arizona for many years and is now the director of uh, cardiac surgery at the University of Arizona. That little small building you just saw, which is outside of Oxum, is where at least legend says the Ark of the Covenant presently resides, and this is the church directly adjacent to it. Uh, the Coptic Christian Church is extremely important in Ethiopia. Uh, these, this, for example, is a Bible that's, that is used there. It's a, it's a Coptic Bible. It has different um, uh, books in it other than ours. Uh, these are a couple of the deacons there. That book dates to the 8th century, and they use it every day, um, literally use that book every day. 
Obviously, if it was a, if it was a humid, moist environment, th this it would not last. In a very dry and arid environment, it does. Um, this little building here is where, at least it is said, the Ark of the Covenant truly resides. There is a Coptic monk who literally is assigned to live and guard and, um, and basically manage the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, and when he dies, uh, the, um, um, I can't remember what they call it, but the equivalent of the Pope of the Coptic Christian Church um, anoints another individual to take over that guardianship and to follow it. Uh, these young children, um, this is also an oxen, which you see down here on the right. This is at 4.30 in the morning. Uh, every morning, there is, a, there is a procession of the of the believers to the Coptic Christian churches for morning services. Similarly, you'll see, um, likewise, in, in areas where the Muslim populations are bigger, you'll see the exact same thing with the Muslim populations basically going to, to services on a regular basis. It's really fascinating. It's a fascinating country from that standpoint, just dealing with the interconnectivity and the interaction of, of the two religions. Um, so that's kind of the way, um, w way we kind of got going. Um, we basically fund ourselves um, the, uh, as far as paying our ways over there. In the process of going, we literally take crates of, in crates of material along with us. Uh, this again is up, on, up in Oxen. This is, gives you a sense of how deserty it can actually be. Um, even, even in fairly east central um, Ethiopia, it truly is uh, um, almost, almost has kind of a feel of, of being in North Africa rather than in Eastern Africa. And again, this is, this is very typical of what the countryside in Eastern Africa looks like. One of the standard modes of transportation for, for a lot of people just going to and fro on the highways. Um, it is an interesting country in that it's had, while it has remained independent, it's had some enormous struggles. Um, Something I was really unaware of is, is that for um, following the, uh, the start of the Cold War, Ethiopia effectively became a communist country and was run by a communist dictatorship for many, many years. And if you read Cutting for Stone, you get a, you get a hint of, and a glimmer of, of that entire history. And it wasn't until quite late that, that that communist dictatorship disappeared and now they quote unquote have a democracy, a typical third world democracy where 99.7% of the people vote for the, par the, par the ruling party. Uh, this is typical. The, the guy in the back there um, is, um, uh, Brett is a professor of um, uh, pediatrics at the University of Arizona. The, the, long late, you know, the lady in front of him is a, Seganet is a, a pediatrician and a professor at Addis Ababa University, which by the way is a sister university to the University of Montana. Anybody involved in forestry, the forestry program here has great ties to Addis Ababa University, as does the School of Business, and there are some other minor ties, and maybe, maybe you all know better than I do what some of the other ties of some of the other departments might be uh, to, to the university uh, in Addis. So there's some real opportunities. This is just a traditional evening dance of a, a traditional evening dinner. It's a remarkable country when it comes to food, to people, uh, to legends, to history. Uh, the operations that we do, we literally do side by side. We'll have an Ethiopian surgeon operating with our cardiac surgeon. We'll have a perfusionist, the person, when we, when we do these heart surgeries, we have to stop the hearts, so we have to put these young children on heart-lung bypass machines, and so we'll have our heart-lung perfusionist sitting side by side with an Ethiopian perfusionist, the same thing with my imaging, the same thing with our nurses. It really is an incredible collaborative effort. And it's a remarkable uh, cross-cultural um, endeavor that we undertake. This is the Bureau of Reclamation in Addis. This is actually an area that was leveled and in the pro was in the process of being rebuilt. Addis truly is a shanty town, or at least much of it, as far as uh, corrugated, um, corrugated um, uh, roof shacks and homes that's slowly changing over time. Six of the 10 most rapidly growing economies in the world are in Africa right now. There is an enormous, uh, um, um, enormously vibrant culture or uh, economy occurring in Africa. This, by the way, is Lake Tana, which is the headwaters of, of the Nile. The economy in, in Eastern Africa is absolutely exploding. And the influence of the Chinese and the Saudis is also likewise exploding. That has major, obviously, international implications uh, in so many ways. Um, that up there is one of the monasteries. That's actually a Coptic monastery um, in, uh, at Lake Tana. Um, 
it is an extraordinarily religious community. When they talk about, as I mentioned as I was reading in, in, in Cutting for Stone, as you fly over the countryside and you see these very small villages, in each, in each and every village, effectively, there will be a central communal structure, which is the church. And almost invariably, it's a Coptic Christian church. These are tapestries in a church at, um, at, off of Lake Tana. These date to the 8th century. These are the original paintings from the 8th century on the walls that tell all the various Bible stories. It's striking. And, and this is just in one small village of about 400 people. Uh, this is uh, St. George, who's the patron saint of Ethiopia. Uh, these are scattered all over, and you can go into just about any community and you'll see these kinds of paintings. These date back. It's remarkable. They have not been touched. These have been literally preserved in their natural state. At least the majority of them have been. Um, uh, the, the Coptic Christian Church is a very traditional church. Uh, the women pray on the out, outer ring, the men pray on the inner ring, and then there's a holy of holies in the, in, in the center where the, where the, um, um, the, the priesthood uh, serves. This is, here's an example of a, of a Bible from the ninth century. This is literally in this little village. This, this Bible has been in this village since the ninth century, another one from the 14th century. Uh, it's truly, you know, it's, it's stunning uh, to see these artifacts in these just small villages. And this is not an atypical village uh, for uh, having um, the artifacts. People do use the local, um, the lake for basically it's their, their source of life, um, including both drinking water and food. Um, there's going to be a couple of interesting slides here um, just in one, one or two seconds, I'm trying to keep this to the right time. Um, this is very fascinating. This is a Coptic Christian monk. It's the first iPad he's ever seen. Um, and there he is praying over this iPad. They're, they're really are remarkable people. Um, very much uh, an agrarian economy still, although um, it's remarkable. They have a, um, a literacy rate approaching 90%. Um, they're very committed as a culture and as a people to education. Um, one of the things that did happen while the communists were in rule in Ethiopia was the development of some public um, services. And what you just saw there was a typical reed boat that dates back three or millennia, uh, typical reed boat that was used in Lake Tana for transportation. This is, as you, can, as you will see, they're literally everywhere. This obviously dates back to biblical times, the use of these reed boats, which are everywhere in, in Lake Tana, uh, which, by the way, is loaded with hippos. And, not uncommonly on a regular, on a basis, they'll tip those boats that we just saw. This is the market in uh, Bardar, which is one of the, um, which is a large city at, 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 at Lake Tana. This is a typical uh, community market in, in um, Ethiopia, and literally anything you might think about wanting to purchase is available in these markets, from grains through all sorts of products. Um, I must say that um, you know resources in this world to some extent are scarce. Um, uh, oh, by the way, these all these little cars you see that are white and blue, the vast majority of them date to um, the communist era uh, and are what are called Ladas, which is an old uh, Russian car that was imported. It was one of the first vehicles imported into into Eastern Africa, and they still have got them running today. Not terribly dissimilar from what happens, I understand, in Cuba, where cars, you know, from the 50s and 60s are still going. These are just going like crazy. This is typical of the countryside between Addis Ababa, which is in the center of the country, and moving north towards um, um, uh, towards uh, uh, Eritrea. Very typical countryside. As you can see, it's fairly sparse, fairly arid, um, and this is typical agriculture in 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 the countryside. Still, uh, up until this year, um, the Boston Marathon had been won for the last 31 years by runners from either Kenya or Ethiopia. And it's pretty obvious why when you, when you consider that they train, generally speaking, at altitudes in excess of 8,000 feet. And invariably, walk, driving the roads in Ethiopia out in the countryside, which are fairly sparse, 
there are um, groups of runners, I mean, literally 40 and 50 kilometers out of any local or sizable community. Uh, this is just a monolith of some kind. I have no idea what it was, but just staggeringly just popped out of the ground there um, in the northern part of the country. The, um, there are 38 major tribes in the country, uh, all with their own languages. Invariably, when we would, uh, we, would, we would work with these children who would come in, they would not uncommonly come from six and 700 kilometers away. They would come in accompanied by a parent, one parent, because most of these families have multiple kids and one parent would stay home with a, with a larger family, but one of the other parents, generally speaking, the father would come down with the child um, to town or to the, to our hospital and both the, the father or the, the, the parent as well as the child would stay there at the hospital. There was actually room for them. Um, with 38 different disparate languages and people coming from all sorts of different, different areas, it was not uncommon to have four translators involved with, actual, with one communication with one family in order to get from one language to another to another to the fi finally to the native language. It was really quite remarkable. Um, this is um, really, truly one of the wonders of the world, I think we already went by it, which are the stone churches in Lalibela, which is truly a, a, it's a remarkable story. There are 13 of these stone churches that were built literally out of granite uh, in the, um, um, that's the Sheraton Hotel, that's not one of the Lalibela churches. But these churches were built literally carved into the granite of the side of the mountain multiple stories up. This is at Gondor, which is one of the royal, one of the o o ancient uh, capitals. But the churches were literally built into the granite of, of the mountain, three and four stories high. Um, Thirteen churches built in just under 20 years, back in the 8th century. It is still unknown how they actually were built. They didn't, at the time, they did not have iron tools in Ethiopia, so how in the world they were able to carve through these churches remains un, uh, truly unknown. Uh, the Ethiopians are a remarkably um, quiet, uh, dignified um, people. Um, they don't complain. Um, in, the, in the five times I've been there, total of just under four months, um, I don't know that anybody has ever complained of being uncomfortable after having open heart surgery. It's pretty remarkable. And these are children. Um, the youngest kids we've operated on, the youngest kid we've operated on is 11 months old, uh, and we've operated all the way through teenagers. And the striking thing and the fun thing for me in this whole endeavor is, is that this is an ongoing activity. And so going back every six to eight to nine months, we go back and have clinics. We, gotta, we have this lovely opportunity to see these kids back, at least some of them back, after anywhere from eight months to two or three or four years from their, their surgeries and be able to see them actually have lives and, and be able to go on. There again, their hope is to, be, is, is to live, to have a family and live into their 40s if at all possible. Um, so, and again, this is, this is the eucalyptus, eucalyptus scaffolding I was talking about. I'm going to pull up one other set of slides here in a second. Anybody got any questions? Because I've just been beating my gums here. I'll go beyond that. Um, in spite of the fact that it's a, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. What's being done to uh, reduce the upstream um, effects, like so dramatic fever isn't taken out all the time? Yeah. Um, I didn't mention um, the, one of the I mentioned Balai Abagaz, who's a local Ethiopian cardiac cert cardiologist, pediatric cardiologist, who, who was a brainstorm behind all of this. Um, in addition to Balai, to show you how to show you the international flavor of all this. Another person who's been very instrumental in this whole thing is a fellow named Sir Magdi Yakub. Uh, Magdi is Ethiopian born um, from Egypt, um, a British trained cardiac surgeon who literally is one of the founding cardiac surgery, cardiac, or founding cardiac surgeons 
of heart valve repair surgery. It's one thing to take an, a beat up heart valve out and put another one in. It's another thing to be able to fix them. The reason we have, with it, that it's preferable to fix them in these kids is if we replace a heart valve and put a new heart valve in a kid, number one, they're going to outgrow it, and number two, they need to be on a blood thinner in these kids, and they neither can afford it nor, nor can they be monitored. So the intent is to repair these valves. Magdi Yakub is an MD, PhD, and his dream in this, in this hospital, and it hasn't happened yet, is in addition to treating these kids, they have a plot of land next to it to do research in vaccines for, for strep. Now, that has been a challenge because of the nature of the, of the, of the bug. Uh, all that being said, Magdi, who is now in his mid to late 70s and has a research institute in London, is still committed to researching how to develop a true vaccine to treat these kids because strep infections are recurrent. You live in, you live in cramped environments, which these kids, this by the way is our hot, the little children's hospital we, we work in. It's, tw it's about, I think, 20 beds um, with a couple of operating rooms and a couple of imaging suites uh, and places for family to stay as well. And this is right next door to that much larger hospital I told you about. Um, his dream is to develop a vaccine so that we can vaccinate kids against the strep world. We have yet, for reasons I'm not, they have yet, for reasons I'm not exactly sure of, been able to convince Bill Gates, who is committed to the world of vaccines. He's actually got a major commitment to vaccine in particular against malaria, which, is, which would be another endemic condition here. Um, in, not in Ethiopia, but in, in Africa, is committed to developing vaccines to treat these conditions because especially with these repetitive inf uh, exposures which these children have because of the world they live in um, would only make all the sense in the world. Um, but it just hasn't happened yet. Again, this is, a, this is a work that's very early in progress. We've been at this for, I think the first mission went over there in 2008, so it's been six, six and a half years we've been doing this. Um, these are two nurses. The one on the right is the director of the critical care pediatric ICU at the University of Arizona. The one on the left is just a floor nurse at the University of Arizona. Um, and these folks give up, same, like, uh, like we do. We take out the, our days there, are generally we operate for 18 hours a day, seven days a week from the day we get there to the day we leave. Um, uh, and it's, um, it's quite a remarkable experience to work with these folks. Um, so that's kind of the basis of what we do. Um, I started m mentioning earlier, um, I think one can very fairly argue that this is a waste of resources. It's a ton of money. When we go over, we'll take somewhere between $100,000 and $200,000 worth of surgical equipment with us to serve these folks. And how many kids do we operate on? Maybe 30 or 35 in the course of a visit there. And I think one could make a very cogent argument that this is an absolute waste of resources. I'll counter that with what my obligation is. My obligation is to care for the people that I am interacting with. Okay? So that my obligation to you, if you come in to see me, is to do my utmost to make your life comfortable and enjoyable. Really, that's really what we do. We're all dying at some point. But in the process, life ought to be a pleasure. These children are not having a pleasurable life. And we've made a choice to spend resources that we've chosen to gather, and the vast majority of the stuff is donated or purchased by us. We fly ourselves over, we put ourselves up, and we, we do this work because it's what we believe in. So that's the, the counter that I have. Um, you know, it's interesting, um, in the United States, for the first time, the question about the value of what we're doing is slowly coming, coming to the floor as a result of the Obamacare legislation. We're starting to talk about are we actually using our dollars appropriately and wisely? And I think at some point we'll ask questions, that same question about here. But I can tell you for right now, having dealt with these children, keep in mind, I'm, I'm an adult cardiologist. This, just today, I've op I helped operate on three individuals, 191, 188, and 185, okay? We probably spent at least as much, if not more, today on those three individuals than we spent in Ethiopia on 35 kids going over there. Okay. So that's just kind of the trade-offs as you, as you think about these things. The moral and ethical dilemmas are right there. They're real. 
Um, would it make more sense to take those dollars and plunk it into water quality in Ethiopia? Probably. I don't know anything about water quality. Okay. I know what I know, I know what I'm good at, and I know what I can give. Okay. In addition to that, and I think we miss this a lot of times when we start thinking about the implications and ramifications of what we do. Um, what we've accomplished in doing this work in Ethiopia is not just working with that little boy. Okay? We've established relationships with people literally halfway around the world who are our colleagues, our partners, our peers in our profession. And I cannot under, or, or under value what that means to my colleagues that I work with in Addis Ababa. The lady on the right there is originally from Ethiopia. Um, she is a, was a resident in anesthesia at the University of Arizona. She has just completed her residency, her, her pediatric anesthesia residency, or will here in six weeks at Mayo Clinic, and she is going back to Ethiopia to be the anesthesiologist at this place. So she will be there, uh, the gal on the right. The fellow on the left, and I mentioned this to, to Gwen earlier, um, his name is Joe Bilal. He's, he's Lebanese. He is a professor at the University of Arizona. Two weeks after these pictures were taken, he was operating on Gabby Giffords in the, oper in, in the operating room at the University of Arizona when she was shot. Um, it's a remarkable bunch of people that I have, I've really been able to, to get to know um, who are just willing to, to put out for this little kid. And you can't tell me that the money we spend taking care of this little kid isn't worth every nickel we spent on him. Um, fellow in the back, um, Elton is a pediatric anesthesiologist from Children's Hospital in Phoenix. And as you can see, the, the facilities, while they're not, you all who don't work in operating rooms, they, these are not what I would call 2014 state of the art. They're pretty reasonable. I mean, we've got it all. Inter interestingly, we just hope the electricity stays on and thank God for generators because it doesn't, about four or five times per case. Sorry about all the sideways here. Uh, four or five times per case. This, by the way, is a, uh, again, this is um, um, the young lady who's going back to run the anesthesia program uh, at this little hospital. Okay. And that's Dr. Mike Teodori, who is a heart surgeon at the University of Arizona. The two young ladies on the left are scrub nurses from Ethiopia who are now doing the actual scrub nurse. And the lady in the middle, Shal Tool, is as good a nurse as I've ever worked with. And she's the head nurse at this little hospital. And the fellow in back is a, is a, is a, pediatric, uh, is a pediatric cardiologist uh, in training there. So this experience is one that you just can't have if we take care of the kids here. And I mean, it really is a cross-cultural interaction that we have. I have a question. Yeah. I think it would be good for Austin to know the barriers um, that we encounter, why the five years ago have not been met in terms of moving and delegating to the, to the local. Politics, bureaucracy, resources. Let's put it at that. It's already 7.15, so we're going to have to quit here. But clearly it's politics, um, you know, dealing with, dealing with ministries, dealing with educational programs, dealing with, with, um, dealing with people in power who really use power in ways that it was not intended. Um, it basically is, it's much of it is that. Um, many of these folks are government employed uh, physicians. Uh, but, oh, by the way, most of these, most of the, the, the nurses and all who work here, their wages paid by this, this, um, this sheik are three times what the wages they can make at the, at the government hospitals. The physicians who work here, the pediatric physicians I work with here, they all volunteer their time to come in here and work here. So they work a full day routinely and then they come here and work on their free time uh, taking care of these kids. Uh, it really is bureaucracy. Probably, probably the big, that's probably the single biggest hurdle to things occurring. Not uncommonly, we'll have, for example, with our supplies we take over, well, it'll be 72 hours getting them through their equivalents of what comes down to customs in, in Ethiopia. Um, one final comment, and then I'll, then I'll stop, and we'll, we can all meet at the, at the celebration. Um, this is a very small world we live in now. Um, you know, I write papers with these folks. We publish papers with these folks about things like strep infections and all. These, are, these folks are literally, while they may be 7,500 miles away, they're our next door neighbors. And each and every one, every, each and every person in here has a skill set 
that can and will translate to someplace else in the world that is in need. And you're young enough and the opportunities are there that if you don't take advantage of, the, of them, shame on you. This is a, we all have, we, we have been given so much in, in, the, in the world that we live in, even here in Missoula, even in Montana, which has the 40, oh, this is another thing. The entire country of Ethiopia, 90 million people, has a gross domestic uh, GDP equivalent to the state of Montana. We are, we are so gifted and blessed in this country that to not take advantage of opportunities to meet these remarkable people and spend time in their world is, is a shame. Don't not take advantage of opportunities when they, when they, when they smack you in the face. And, and, and if you're at all hesitant, I just encourage you to reach out and try it because you just can't, I mean, the, the experience is worth its weight in any other lifetime experience you'll ever have. Um, and I'll stop. Well, thank you, Joe. I think that's a very um, appropriate way to end the lecture series. Um, and I think tonight you've had another really good example of why we called this lecture series Montana's Mountains Beyond Mountains. The work that Joe's done and the work that the other people have done that you've uh, encountered in the last 12 weeks indicates that we've got some really special folks here. So let's give Joe a round of applause.